Watch more programs like this on cable and stream with PCN Select. Subscribe at PCNTV.com. I'm here with Senator Lisa Vascola, a Democrat from the Lehigh Valley. Thank you for being with us today. Oh, it's great. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. With your district soon to uh, shift to the green phase at the end of this week, what does that mean for people and businesses in the area? Well, they're excited, let me tell you. And um, the fact that we had some outdoor dining available the last couple of weeks because we were in the yellow phase, we found a way in the Lehigh Valley to have um, like parking lots and stuff used so that more people can enjoy the outdoor dining and they are packed. Um, so now that you can have 50% indoor capacity um, dining, there's a lot of businesses that are, you know, pretty excited about it, but want to be safe. And, and same with the hair salons, like they're really excited. People want to get their hair cuts and color done and the nails done and things like that. But um, we have to make sure that it's safe and the protocols are in place. And from what I gather here in the Lehigh Valley, our businesses are doing a really good job. In fact, I've been to a few, you know, in green and yellow, right, when we were in yellow, that you had to wait outside before you were even allowed in because there's no waiting room available because that's where, you know, you can't social distance. But then when you got into the actual doctor's office or whatever, you, you know, had your one-on-one, -on -one, had an eye exam one-on-one, -on -one, you know, with my eye doctor, but had to wait outside. So, and then there's the masks, the gloves, and the disinfecting. So our our businesses are doing a really good job and, and really they don't want their patrons to get sick. They don't want to get sick. And I don't think anybody understands, like maybe in the media, you see all these people saying, I don't want to wear a mask. Well, we don't really see that here in the Lehigh Valley. And, and while we've had our fair number of cases here in the Lehigh Valley, we still weren't hit as hard as the collar counties and our healthcare networks, you know, they weren't overwhelmed. They, they didn't hit crisis numbers with the ICU bed availability and ventilators. So overall, I'm pretty optimistic that the county, you know, the valley here, that we're going to recover a little bit more quickly than other areas in that we also have a lot of businesses here that employ essential, you know, employees. So whether it's healthcare distribution, manufacturing, a lot of businesses here kind of coped with the COVID and didn't shut down. Uh, and that's going to save the Lehigh Valley because 40% 40, 40 of our workforce are in jobs deemed essential. And that's the important here. But the focus is now going to be on the uh, small business mom and pop owner, you know, who had to shut down for three months or significantly reduce their business operations. And, you know, we're going to have to figure out how to handle this because they are the core to our urban centers. And it's been critical in our redevelopment efforts, these small mom and pop shops uh, moving forward. So that's gotta be our focus. And then the other positive thing that's going on here in the Lehigh Valley is Wind Creek Casino, which is one of our largest employers. That hasn't opened yet, but it will be open on Monday, not to full capacity, but it's something that, you know, the people in the Lehigh Valley are weighing in and saying, oh, I'm so excited, you know, to be able to go back to the casino. So there's some good news here. And, um, you know, we're trying as hard as we can. And the people here are very, um, they, they, they know the importance of making sure there's not a spike or increase because we're doing things irresponsibly. Uh, despite expressing how much you wanted the Lehigh Valley to reopen, you voted against House Resolution 836, which would end uh, Governor Wolf's disaster declaration. With that resolution now being handled by the courts and your district soon to be shifting to the green phase, do you still feel like the disaster declaration is necessary? Well, look, there was no other state that ended a decla the emergency declaration, right? And there was a reason for that because you have to rely on state funding and other things. So even the states that, are, well, what we call were the freer states where they really didn't shut down anything, they still had emergency declarations. So the emergency declaration was nothing about opening up businesses. I already voted to open up businesses, help real estate, car dealerships, and so forth. So now that the court case is coming, I hear there might be a decision by the end of the week. We'll see what they have to say. 
As chair of the Senate Democratic Policy Committee, you held a virtual town hall to discuss how COVID-19 has affected Pennsylvania's food supply chain. What are some of the ways that you discussed um, addressing those issues and preventing them if they happen in the future? Well, it, it became apparent that a lot of the um, people that were uh, engaged in these businesses, the suppliers and so forth, um, really encouraged us to do everything we can to help our restaurants because that fell apart. I mean, I didn't realize that we were dumping milk and um, cows being slaughtered and stuff like that without going anywhere, you know, to in our food chain supply, which is disappointing um, because the restaurants were closed. I didn't realize how integral the restaurants were in this whole distribution system. So that's one of the things we have to concentrate on. But it was also, what do we know about our food chain supply and how do we make sure that this doesn't happen again, that we waste food, waste milk, and all this, all these other products, because it was uncalled for. Knowing that people are hungry and then we're, and then we're wasting food is kind of ridiculous in a pandemic. So what we figured out was we need to do stress tests moving forward um, to figure out how and why and when this shouldn't happen again, right? And so that hearing was critical, and I, I put in legislation on the stress test moving forward, because if we ever have another pandemic, which I hopefully, you know, we never will, but we can't say we never will because everybody thought this wouldn't happen, and it did, um, we have to figure this out, especially if there's not a vaccine. And I, I, I loved that hearing because I learned so much, even from the mom and pop farmers out there that are really stressed and having a hard time making it. Luckily, I think the federal government, the CARES money, and also the state of Pennsylvania, we recognize the value of our farmers and we have to help them out. We've seen that throughout this pandemic, the black and brown community has been disproportionately affected by COVID-19, um, especially with everything going on following the response to the death of George Floyd. What are some ways that you and uh, your colleagues plan to address issues uh, specifically affecting those communities? Well, we passed some legislation um, in the Senate, but that had to deal more with police force and how to get them trained, um, you know, no chokeholds, things like that. So that's, that's sailing through the legislature. But when it comes to COVID-19, I mean, we have to recognize that with COVID-19, when you were placed in situations where, you know, you're in housing and it's really tight. There's no room for social distancing. You know, when you have families living together and so forth. We have to deal with the socioeconomics of the black, black brown community. And it, not just during COVID though, this has affected them. And it's all about how do you lift them up? Maybe the, raising the minimum wage and other things have to be part of this discussion because you, you can't have them um, making very little money that they can't support their families. So that's more of the broader discussion. And they were hit hard, I think, because of poverty, right? And because they're in such tight-knit quarters. And the urban areas, whether you're black, brown, white, got hit hard. And uh, we have to focus on that in the future. And probably if there's another pandemic, we have to make sure there's more testing, more PPE available, all those things for those communities. Um, of course, shifting to the green phase is a very hopeful uh, sign, but there are new cases that are still appearing in Pennsylvania. What is the trend of new cases in your area and how are you uh, advising people to continue to stay safe and take precautions? Well, we're continuing to go down. You know, we're still in yellow. We're continuing to go down. Our cases aren't high. Um, which is a really good sign. And I think it's because people here are trying to be responsible. But now as we're going forward and we're testing the nursing homes on a weekly basis or bi-weekly, I think was the decision now, they, we're gonna get more positive. So I want people, as more testing becomes available, I mean, think about it. When the peak was happening five, six weeks ago, we were testing about 3,000 people, right, a day. Now it's 10,000. So whenever you test more people, you're going to get more positives. The key to this all is hospitalizations and how many people are being hospitalized and treated for this COVID-19. And, you know, so far we're doing really good. I'm, I'm proud of us. And I think if we just be responsible and open up our businesses with the social mitigation, the masks, please wear a mask. I hear from healthcare professionals constantly that that mask is the most important thing we do to keep each other safe. Not only ourselves, but the other person next to us and our family members. So we're doing a good job. Um, 
And finally, you know, I, I, I'm really proud that um, the community colleges, by the way, in our area have stepped up to the plate uh, on unemployment here because they've they're they're working together with the workforce board and they're launching a campaign for free training for displaced workers who qualify. And that's, you know, so that these displaced workers, you know, it, try to get a high demand job here in the Lehigh Valley. And I never seen so many people trying to cooperate to figure this out and how to help people. And so our community, Lehigh Valley has been really good at systems kind of working together and caring about people and trying to help. And finally, you mentioned your concern for those mom and pop shops. What further legislation would you like to see or are you working on at the moment to help support all of our PA businesses? It's basically all of them, but you know, most of it's trying to figure out because there is going to be, there's CARES money involved with this from the federal government and how to drive that out responsibly to our small businesses in the form of grants. There's also loans available for small businesses. We want to try to keep that interest rate as low as possible, if no interest rate at all, and um, trying to work with them to increase their capacity when possible. And those are the things that you know we're, we're looking at in the legislature and trying to um, take into consideration what they're saying to us. That's why we got outside dining under the yellow phase is because we listened to the businesses and said, well, we need to expand it because I only have maybe a couple tables now, but can you give me a few more or can we open up these streets? And then um, part, I know in Bethlehem and Easton, we, we actually shut down streets to allow the, the uh, restaurants to come out and offer more outside dining. So the more we listen to the business community, the more we listen um, to small business and mom and pops on what they actually need to survive and exist, I think the legislature can um, move forward with them and, and help them out. I really do. All right, Senator Lisa Bascola, Democrat from Lehigh Valley, thank you so much for being with us today. Oh, it's great to be here. Thank you. Be safe, everyone. After a great victory over Union forces in June 1863, Robert E. Lee marches his army to Pennsylvania. The advancing Confederates clash with General Meade's Union Army at Gettysburg, beginning the most famous battle of the Civil War. Explore our nation's past and the Gettysburg battlefield with the Gettysburg Collection. Become a member to stream the library online. Learn more at gettysburgcollection.com. I'm here with Jill Fink, Executive Director of the Merchants Fund. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. So to start off, can you just describe what the Merchants Fund is and what you do? Sure. So like the shortest explanation of the Merchants Fund is that we give small grants to small businesses. Um, we focus on businesses that have a financial need. That's one of the requirements. Um, and beyond that, you know, we're really looking at businesses that are in, um, low-income communities, um, largely owned by um, minorities, people of color, women, immigrants, um, often they're mom and pop shops where like the entire household income comes from the, the business. Um, so we really are looking to prioritize like the businesses that, that have the greatest amount of need and, um, and that do a lot for their communities. And when the pandemic uh, hit, how did you pivot your approach to providing aid to suddenly so many businesses that needed help. Yeah. And so many that we, that we still haven't been able to help because the, the need is so great. Um, so, you know, historically the merchants fund, when we make grants, they are grants of up to $10,000 and they're for a discrete project that will help a business to either stabilize or take advantage of an opportunity to grow their business. And when the pandemic hit, we realized that, you know, everybody needed to stabilize their business, right? Um, that most businesses weren't going to be taking on new projects and that the, that the, the greatest impact that we could have would just be to do like working capital grants, which are not typically part of our grant portfolio. Um, but we needed to just give money to businesses and let them use the money however they needed to, to be able to survive. Um, and that might be for things like, rent or utilities or to pay employees, um, which all would typically be things that we would not fund. Um, and then to try to be able to, to stretch the dollars, you know, as far as we could and help as many businesses as we could. Um, we made those grants $5,000 um, rather than 10. I think at the time though, too, like we also, 
I don't think any of us expected that things would be going on this long. Um, and so when we first started, I don't know, it's hard to even like think back that far, right? Like what our thinking was then versus what it's like now. Um, but I think most of us thought that it was probably going to be like till, you know, end of April, maybe early May. And like, here we are towards the end of June and this is still going on. Um, and so that $5,000 for some businesses are able to stretch it a little bit farther. Um, but a lot of businesses are, I mean, every business is still has a lot of need. And are those initial COVID-19 aid grants still available or do you plan to make them more available in the future? So our, our hope is to be able to make them available again, I think, because we know that the need is there. Um, when the pandemic did hit, our board um, dedicated our entire grant budget for the year to these, um, uh, you know, to these emergency grants. And we've now spent all of that money. Um, and so we are like actively fundraising and trying to bring in more money. And so the more money we can bring in, the more money we can, you know, immediately like redirect to go back out the door. And then our board will also look at, you know, what kind of investments we have, where we can pull, you know, funds from those investments. Um, in the short term, right now, we're immediately focused on, we're administering a grant fund from the Commerce Department uh, for $1.4 million dollars to businesses that were um, impacted uh, with damage from the uprisings a couple weeks ago. And so while we're, we're wrapping up a couple of the grants from the COVID fund that we had um, for the next few weeks, we'll be really focused on just getting that $1.4 million to businesses that have that physical damage. Um, and then, you know, hopefully like reorient and again, continue to fundraise so that we can help get money back out to the businesses who are still trying to recover. Uh, the pandemic has affected so many people and uh, Philadelphia itself is a very diverse city. You mentioned your priority has always been uh, targeting mom and pop shops and diverse communities. Have you been able to reach those communities uh, during this pandemic with uh, your aid grants? Yeah, you know, I think that, you know, a lot of organizations you know, rightfully so, are targeting like these, like the most vulnerable communities and the ones that we know are being hit the hardest. And, um, and some have more success than others. And historically, we've had, you know, sometimes more success and sometimes less. But I will say that in this time, like we have been um, really, really intentional about reaching the communities that we wanted to reach. And it meant that we did things in a different way. Like our grant process this time was by invitation only. Um, and that was for a couple of reasons. One, we're a really small staff. It's like me and one part-time person. And so if we had opened this up, you know, really broadly, um, we would have had thousands of applications and just such a backlog that we wouldn't have been able to even like be immediately responsive to the businesses that need it. Um, but so we worked really closely with our partners, community development corporations, corridor managers, um, some of the CDFIs, the um, community development financial institutions, and said, these are our priorities. Who are the businesses in your community um, that fit these priorities? And, you know, we were looking at um, where the poverty rate was 25% or higher, um, you know, black, brown, immigrant owned, you know, and and we've, and we've done that. We've done, you know, 97% of our grants have been to people of color and immigrants. 60% um, have been, over 60% have been to women. Um, and, and it just shows like when you are really intentional. Now, some of those grants, they're harder to get across the finish line, right? It's, it, there's a lot of handholding to get the grants submitted. Um, there's a lot of back and forth with partners when there's language barriers, there's, you know, extra steps. Um, but if you're committed to the work, then you're committed to, um, to all of that handholding and the extra steps. And again, by doing it by invitation only, in a lot of ways, it felt really crummy that we had to do it that way. Um, but it enabled us to, to really go deep, um, with those businesses. And then also to be able to follow up with some of them when we, can say like, hey, here's some additional help that we wanna to try to connect you with, or can we support you in this other way? Um, so yeah, so I'm really, I'm, I'm proud of the work that the organization has done and, and of our board for, for really seeing the need and putting the resources behind um, 
behind the efforts to meet that need. And uh, you mentioned that this this specific grant was invite only. Uh, for those that aren't, or for those that uh, you can apply to, what does it take for a business to actually qualify, and how do they apply? So, um, so the eligibility criteria is that the business like must be located in Philadelphia. Um, must be located in Philadelphia. It has to be the business's, um, the business owner's primary source of income. Um, for our COVID grants, you know, we, well, for all of our grants, we ask that businesses are, are tax compliant. Um, so they, they, they pay their federal, state, and city taxes. Um, if they are behind on taxes, that they're on an approved payment plan, um, that businesses have all of the right licenses and permits to operate legally. Um, and that's, that's pretty much it in terms of like the, like the prime, like eligibility criteria, um, in our, in like quote normal times, um, we focus on businesses that have been in existence for at least three years. Um, or like we don't typically fund startups, um, with our COVID grants, there have been a few exceptions to that, um, where younger businesses, if we feel like they've been really, um, important to the community or our community partners say, like this is a business that has like really brought our community together or, um, and we also, you know, we focus on the businesses that may be the only business in their area that serve a particular need. Um, so if it's the only daycare center and the community is really dependent on that daycare center for people to be able to work, then we want to make sure that, you know, we're putting um, resources into that business to keep it going. And finally, looking towards the future, I know you mentioned in the near future, your focus is just on uh, providing these specific loans, but do you anticipate that you'll ever be able to return to your normal sort of stabilization loans, or do you plan to continue to think of new ways to provide aid for people who have just been affected by COVID-19? It's a great, it's a great question. And I will say that, right, like, I don't even know what normal will be anymore. So like, I think that like this moment calls for all of us to think about a new normal um, and to continually be able to like shift and adapt and pivot and be responsive to whatever is coming up at the time. And um, so it makes planning a little bit more challenging, but I will say that even before the pandemic, you know, we were having conversations within our organization about, you know, looking at, how a business has different needs at different times in their life cycle and how can the merchants fund be there at those different periods of time. And so stabilization, a stabilization grant can look different for a different type of business and for a business at a different stage. Um, and sometimes, sometimes it might not be a grant, but it might be like this business needs a loan, but they can't get a loan because they don't have collateral. And so can the merchants fund do a loan guarantee? Right. And so trying to think like more creatively, um, especially if they've gotten a grant from us before and we've already invested in the success of that business, how do we continue to invest in their success long term? All right. Jill Fink, Executive Director of the Merchants Fund. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for having me. PCN brings the distinct aspects of Pennsylvania and its residents to your favorite screen. Hear from state government and community leaders during unedited balanced coverage of politics and policy. Dig into the rich history and culture of the state presented by notable residents and historians. Score a view of the best high school, college, and world-class athletes competing across the state and much, much more. Start exploring the Keystone State today on PCN and the PCN app. I'm here with Doug Harbach, Communications Director at the Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. So with in-person gaming being unavailable due to the COVID-19 pandemic, what, do you, what have you observed about the trend of people turning to other types of gaming during the pandemic? Well, there has been uh, certainly an uptick in uh, online gaming. Pennsylvania was fortunate that we're one of only three states as the pandemic closed down land-based casinos all over the country to have uh, games online, which included slot machines, table games, poker, and even sports wagering, uh, so that uh, when people could no longer participate in the land-based casinos, they did go to online. So when we looked at numbers um, in, for March, 
which of course the casinos closed down about mid-March and looked at the numbers that we uh, last compiled for a full month in May, those numbers have more than doubled uh, during that period of time. So there certainly is a lot more play going on online. And as, can, as counties begin to reopen and shift to the green phase, can people expect to see uh, a lot of that in-person gaming begin to return right quickly? Well, we have 12 operating casinos in Pennsylvania. And as we speak today, six of them are already open for operation. We expect that uh, several more will open at the end of this week, uh, so on Friday. And then also we expect another one to open Monday and then another one to open about a week later. So uh, all things being the same, if nothing changes within the directives from the governor and the health department, we would expect to have all 12 of them up and running within the next week or two. And what kinds of precautions are being made at the casinos that are currently open or plan to be opened to continue to keep people safe and uh, social distance? The casinos are going to be a lot different for people when they walk in there. Um, we put out some protocols that uh, we want the casinos to follow, and these are safety measures for patrons, for their employees, and anybody else that steps inside the casino. Um, they would, first of all, um, not see as many games operating when it comes to slot machines. Some have uh, chosen to turn off every other machine. Some have chosen to take away chairs. Uh, at each machine, so there's spatial distancing. We've also put up a number of uh, barriers in between some of the games and also barriers at the table games on some of them. Um, and some of those games, uh, like like a, a game for blackjack, where there might usually be five people, there will only be three chairs sat there. Um, everybody that walks into the casino uh, under the guidelines are to wear a mask, as are the casino employees. Um, these casinos will not operate 24-7 at first as they normally do. Each of them is choosing to close a number of hours overnight so they can do some deep cleaning. Uh, some of the restaurants will not be open yet. They will supply some food and some delivery within the, in the gaming floor. Um, but at this point, you won't see that. And even you won't see, for example, valet service at the front of the casino. You can come in, you can drop somebody off if they need to, but at this point uh, it's just too risky to have individuals crawling inside uh, people's cars and driving them off. What has been the financial impact of the pandemic? Because as you mentioned, there has been a, a sharp increase in online gaming, but has that increase been able to alleviate the loss from uh, the time spent during the pandemic out of, um, out of business? No, unfortunately it hasn't, and we're probably looking at uh, somewhere in the vicinity of 100 million plus per month that has been lost by the Commonwealth. The bread and butter in the casino industry in Pennsylvania still are the land-based slot machines. Uh, they get a significant amount of play. They are taxed at a high rate. So uh, a lot of revenue has been lost because of those being down along with the tables. And of course, while we still have um, some sports wagering going on, as you can imagine, uh, that can only be done online. And, and the um, amount of games and the types of games with the major sports also shutting down has been very limited. That's why, and there's been a lot of articles written on this, um, and, and they are funny to a, to a degree, that um, now that people are wagering on things like Russian ping pong, uh, because that's something that, you know, they like to participate in it, and they, they, uh, they still find the excitement in that. The Pennsylvania Senate this week proposed expanding gambling to bars and restaurants to uh, draw in guests to those uh, businesses that have been affected by COVID-19. What's your department's stance on this expansion? Well, we uh, always like to say that, that we regulate, we do not legislate. We know that from looking at the bill that um, should something happen uh, to expand either video gaming terminals or possibly to reg start regulating these skill games, that the Gaming Control Board would have some role in it. Uh, and we're prepared to do that just as we were in 2017 when the gaming expansion bill passed. Um, and we were prepared to do that. And, and that was uh, a heavy lift, if you recall, because at one time uh, our agency was asked to get up and running and start regulating uh, online games, sports wagering, video gaming terminals, also start to do regulation on fantasy games. All those things kind of came at once. 
And uh, we, we began the process and we've got them up and running now. And with counties continuing to reopen and casinos starting to open again, do you anticipate that online game, the trend of online gaming will diminish or uh, after observing its success, will it uh, continue to grow and uh, will, will more be invested into that mode of, of gaming? Well, if I had a crystal ball, I would say that, you know, you know certainly because uh, of the pandemic and the closure of the casinos, a lot of people for the first time have used an online um, gaming site and they may enjoy it and they may either, if not use it exclusively, may choose to use it for some of their entertainment. Um, so we won't know really until we get the casinos up and running in a big way um, what the effect will be on those on those internet revenues. I can tell you that the, that the casinos are popular. We, we took a look at two Western casinos and what their revenue numbers were just in the first 12 days they opened up compared to a similar 12 days last year. Uh, one of them was right on par where they normally is, and the other one was significantly up when it came to slot machine revenue. So we know people are, are very anxious to get back into the land-based casinos also. And finally, even during the pandemic when a lot of the casinos were not open and even continuing now today, has the Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board continued to advocate for um, gambling addiction support and um, advocating for people who might have continued that addiction during this pandemic? Yeah, that's the number one priority with us uh, always. Um, and one of the things that we made sure were in place and, and, and very glad they were in place as this uh, higher use of internet gaming has ramped up because of the pandemic is a couple things. One, just like at land-based casinos, individuals can self-exclude themselves from gaming online, whether it's sports wagering, whether it is the casino type games, they sign up and they're blocked from playing. The games also carry um, tools within them that allow them to limit themselves when it comes to time spent on the site or on the amount of uh, money that they would spend at a given time, those tools were in place also. So we realized that the easier that you make access to gambling, um, the more issues that may develop. So we've made sure that there are indeed tools in place for individuals who can't control their spend. And finally, looking towards the future, even though uh, reopening is a very hopeful sign, what new challenges do you anticipate that uh, your board will soon face in the in near future? Well, there's there's always um, a new and uh, emerging uh, technology that comes into into gaming. Um, certainly, the one thing you mentioned earlier is will there be more of these uh, games that are within uh, bars and taverns and other places that we have to regulate? That would be one thing we have to look at. But also uh, a lot of other things that come down the line. Uh, one of the, one item that uh, is starting to get some traction uh, is cashless. Uh, wagering uh, in the casinos. That's something that has not been done. It's usually a cash business still, but now there's more and more push for some of that. So all the, and all those issues, of course, when um, it becomes, you know, easier to uh, be able to spend money in a casino also dovetails back to what we just talked about. And that is that our role is to protect the public. And we need to make sure that we are providing a safe environment for them and also tools that will allow them uh, to stay out of any injury to their, to their personal and financial life. All right, Doug Harbaugh, Communications Director for the Pennsylvania Gaming Control Board. Thank you for your time. Thank you for having us.